Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining today's uh, webinar. I'm Tony Thurman, your state superintendent. Uh, today, we have an opportunity to discuss in detail uh, guidance for uh, school opening. Um, we are grateful to have a number of uh, partners who are going to help us today answering some of your questions. The time is set up so that the balance of time is spent on answering your questions. And so uh, we're going to get to it. I'm going to keep my comments brief and all the speakers are, are going to do the same. Um, we, in the interest of time, we've asked all of you who represent school districts or educators or other groups to give us your questions in advance so that we can make sure we get through them. Um, whatever we don't get through today, we promise to come back to you and give you an answer um, after today's session so that everyone has the information that you need. And so I'm grateful that you're here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm grateful to have our partner from the governor's office and Ben Cheetah. Um, ben is gonna take us through some high level thinking about what we're gonna do today. And then uh, we're gonna move right through and then hear from um, our state board president, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, and then hear from Dr. Pan um, from the Department of Public Health who'll take us through the specifics. Ben, take it away. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, I, just, I want to briefly recap what the governor announced on Friday and then leave the balance of, the time, uh, of our time together to answer questions. Um, there are really two bottom lines uh, that I think we can all agree on. The first is learning is non-negotiable, whether it's in person or at a distance. And then second is, you know, we all uh, uh, prefer in-person instruction, whether you're a pa family or you're, whether you're a parent or student, uh, teacher or other staff, um, but it's only if it's safe for all, uh, it's safe for students, staff and the community at, at writ large. Uh, I think those are just the two bottom lines that we're driving towards. How do we uh, meet those bottom lines? Uh, the governor outlined a five point plan, uh, which was a combination of old and new policies. First. Uh, guidelines on when to open, when to close. I know top of mind for a lot of people right now is, you know, when is it the right time to open? And the answer to that is really uh, looking to uh, our county monitoring list. Um, I think one of the uh, great things about the county monitoring list is that there's great transparency around it. If you go to covid19.ca.gov, you can literally see whether your, your county is on that list. You can see the exact data underlying why they are on that list, whether it's upward or downward trends. So you can kind of get a sense of, you know, what to expect, expect in, the, in, the, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, really, uh, the decision is driven by local data. Uh, but determined also by local action. Uh, and the governor repeated that over just, you know, his noon conference today. And I want to, I think it, re it bears uh, repeating again, which is at the end of the day, uh, the agency and action of uh, all of us uh, at the local level, um, wearing masks and following other um, precautions is really going to determine whether or not, you know, uh, when and when and how we, we can reopen uh, for in-person instruction. Um, number two, there's, there's the next three sets of uh, points are really aligned with, you know, if you're going to, if you are going to open for in-person instruction, how do you do it safely? Uh, so number two is uh, masks, it's a proven countermeasure. Number three is uh, school site adaptations, which are part of our June 5th, the CDPH's June 5th guidance, but also part of the updated guidance, recognizing that there's going to be great variability between different schools uh, and their needs. Uh, and their community's needs. And then number four, uh, in terms of the plan, is testing and contact tracing, uh, ensuring that we're monitoring and responding to risks on a real-time basis. And then fifth, uh, if you do need to, you know, uh, switch from in-person instruction over to distance learning. Uh, we worked in partnership with the legislature uh, to ensure that our budget included both the resources and requirements uh, to ensure that uh, distance learning happened, distance learning is meaningful. Uh, so there's $5.3 billion with a B in additional funding to help uh, address learning and uh, address the digital divide when it comes to uh, distance learning. Um, and there are also requirements attached, uh, which include uh, bridging the digital divide for students who uh, need computing devices and connectivity in order to uh, access their educational opportunities, uh, ensuring that instruction is rigorous, and ensuring that there's daily live interaction between teachers and students. Uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Pan and others and Dr. Darlingham and really dive more deeply um, and uh, want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, I know that you all are well acquainted uh, with Dr. Linda Darlingham and uh, it's hard to be an educator uh, without uh, being well acquainted with her, um, but I, Dr. Pan might be a new face. I want to kind of give you a little bit of uh, background about her. Um, 
she's our new state epidemiologist uh, and was integral in, in uh, helping develop the set of guidelines that were uh, 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 announced on Friday. Um, she's absolutely no stranger to this space. She's board certified in pediatric infectious diseases, which seeks, strikes me as an extremely germane experience. Uh, and immediately prior to this, she was the uh, Alameda County uh, local health officer. So she's definitely uh, very well acquainted with uh, the both the state and local interactions of these decisions. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to hand it back to uh, you, Superintendent, uh, to keep this uh, to keep the conversation going. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ben, and uh, stay with us. I'm sure there'll be questions uh, that we, you may be able to answer. Uh, our State Board President needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond has been appointed by the governor to serve on the State Board. She's a fabulous leader, a fabulous researcher, has really identified research from all across the world about what's happening around COVID-19, and a great partner that we're happy to have now say a few words. Uh, take it away, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. Thanks. So I'll also keep my comments brief. We're really all <clears throat> eager to get into the conversation about the health guidance. I just want to start first by thanking educators uh, for in California for the commitment and creativity and flexibility and adaptability that uh, everyone has shown in this time. And we will need more of that in the months to come uh, as, you know, uh, we reopen some schools, others reopen later, and we manage this process that the guidance will uh, help clarify. Um, as Ben said, the major goal is in-person instruction and we wanna get there for all kids in all parts of the state as quickly as we can. Um, human contact is important. Uh, as the guidance we've put out previously suggests, social emotional uh, supports and learning are gonna be extremely important. Uh, and we're gonna need to figure out how to deliver those online when we cannot do it in person uh, so that the trauma that many kids have experienced, the a variety of um, uh, settings in which they're learning and the needs that they have uh, for social emotional uh, resilience and supports is met. Uh, as Ben also said, there is a significant resource in the budget to be sure that daily synchronous instruction can happen with devices, connectivity, uh, and uh, curriculum, uh, which is being um, made available through county offices of education, through the CDE, through the CCEE. Um, there are a lot of resources, both for the academic uh, side of this uh, equation and the social and emotional side. Uh, the uh, instructional continuity plans that uh, many of you are in the middle of developing, the CDE has put a template together. CCEE has a playbook, should allow us to figure out how there's a curriculum available as schools may need to open in one format and then continue in another, or as individual students may need to be uh, out of school for periods of time if there is a need to quarantine for a period of time. So that uh, conceptualizing in-person and, con and connected uh, by computer learning as coherent is going to be a major piece of making the health side of this work as well as the educational side of it. Um, and finally, uh, there is distance learning guidance coming from the department uh, very shortly that will be uh, more um, supportive still in terms of the features of distance learning that are found to be effective and the resources that will support you in that work. Uh, and the uh, pieces of the guidance that help us think about how to keep kids in relationship with each other are gonna be very important as well for the small cohorts that you'll need to think about creating when staff and students are in school together so that uh, we can keep infection rates low and so that that small family unit um, can be with each other throughout the day. I'm going to turn this back to Tony so he can move us along and so that we can get to Dr. Pam. Thank you, Dr. Lynn and Darling Hammond. Appreciate your partnership. Uh, you know, I also want to mention that we have today from the Department of Finance for available for technical assistance, uh, Jessica Holmes. You know, it's hard. We're talking about resources and a lot of times there just aren't any, but I would appreciate you, Ms. Holmes, that you always continue to think about students at the center of everything that we do even when we have to have those tough conversations. We're glad that you're here today. 
And we're proud to introduce to you in this capacity, uh, someone who many of you know from her work in Alameda County as a county health officer. Um, we're grateful to have someone with a, such a unique background in pediatric and infectious disease a specialty, um, certainly a, a expertise that we need at this time. Without any further ado, we take it over, turn it over to you, Dr. Erica Pan. We look forward to your remarks. Great, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, this is week two for me as the state epidemiologist, but I'm really excited and thrilled that I got to one of my first tasks was to really help with this guidance. So I'm very uh, passionate as a pediatric um, person with infectious disease training, and I'm a parent too. So, you know, I, this all um, is very important to me. So, and it's, it's a great opportunity to also talk to all of you today. Um, so I thought I'm gonna run through a few things, just quickly again, recap the, the guidance itself. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about this county data monitoring list, just to kind of hopefully unpack that. You can understand a little better what's behind that and just explain some of the rationale behind it and what it is, how it works. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the rationale behind a potential waiver. Um, and the science of why we would do that for elementary school kids and, and not all kids. And, um, and then just also walk you through a little bit what happens um, when we have a first case in a situation and, and what we do for the public health side and what to envision, which is also somewhat outlined in here, but always helpful to hear about it, I think, and then answer a lot of your questions. So um, to start out with, again, you know, you've hopefully all seen kind of our guidance that got posted on Friday. And essentially what we've done is we've, we've tried to use a, a benchmark or um, parameters that we are looking at to make all kinds of decisions right now during this pandemic. So uh, you probably have heard as far as uh, this county monitoring list that there were different decisions and directives from the state level around what could be open or closed based on these indicators on this county data monitoring list. So what is in this? And it's on, again, our website, um, the CDPH and the COVID, it's actually, you can get to it a couple different ways on the state website. So the, um, Ben mentioned one of them. And it's, I think about it in sort of three different buckets or these three different areas. The table on the county data monitoring list has uh, one uh, listed about testing, how much testing is done in that county. And so there's some benchmarks that have uh, been come up with around the country and around the world about how many tests you should be able to do based on your population to try to detect as many cases as possible. So uh, that is one of the parameters that is on that uh, monitoring list. It actually doesn't get people on the list if you are under that capacity, but it's just been a nice benchmark for people to follow. And so you'll see out there either uh, 150 or 200 per 100,000 people is sort of the benchmark people have been looking at. And many, many counties now have actually surpassed that. Um, we've reached a little bit of a bump in the road lately with a little bit of a hitting up against. We had a dramatic increase over the last several weeks, I'd say, in the state, and most places have met a benchmark, and then there's there's been some delays in turnaround time, and we have a, a reinvigorated testing task force, which may come up again later. It's really working on figuring out what those barriers are, making sure we have more lab capacity. We just signed up another lab on Friday that actually we're going to be able to refer people to to get more testing. So we'll touch on that a little bit more later, but that's one column. So testing in order to find cases and detect cases and sort of have a way to monitor. And then we have what um, I call our epidemiology indicators. So there's a couple of different ways to look at those and slice and dice them. We look at uh, new cases. And because, you know, there's a lot of uh, reporting sort of, uh, you know, sometimes we have a Monday uh, delay from reporting over the weekend where we have a huge bump. And then sometimes there's, you know, just again, depending on where people are being seen and tested. Um, so we look over a 14 day period, how many new cases over that 14 day period per 100,000 people. And so the benchmarks there um, that we have around that is if, if a jurisdiction is over 100 per 100,000 people over a 14 day period of new cases, then that is uh, what we flagged as a concerning thing, especially if that lasts for more than several days. Uh, so that's one parameter. And then you may have heard a lot in the media and elsewhere about testing percent positivity. Uh, and so that's another way, it's, it's an interesting parameter or indicator because it tells us a few things. It tells us, um, again, one idea around this is that if you are testing more and more people, if you're over testing, then the number of people who are positive is gonna decrease, so that percent is gonna decrease. So that it's sort of, in some ways, a benchmark of testing capacity. Like, are you, in some ways, over testing in a way to look for cases and not missing any, right? You're trying to have a higher sensitivity to not miss cases. And then it also tells you, um, how much might be circulating in the community. So it's not, um, it's not an end all be all for that, but it's a trend that we like to follow. Because again, if the testing decreases 
And I would say early on in this pandemic, when we were first, when we had some testing challenges, you know, the testing percent positivity was around 40% because we really only tested people who we were highly suspicious that had the disease based on either their travel and their symptoms. And now that we're seeing, you know, now we know that uh, a lot of people don't even have symptoms that are infected. Um, we still have other criteria. We just updated those again last week as well. But on who we think might have the most, what we call pre-test probability uh, to test. And so that will change over time as well. But again, the trend itself is really helpful. So, and the benchmark for that, again, we've been looking at at the state level is if it's less than 8%, then we actually feel more comfortable that that's a manageable level in the community. And if it's above 8%, that gets you on our, if you have um, above 8%, that gets you on our county data model. And then the other parameters we look at are um, really because another big goal around this pandemic, especially as we've really grappled with the fact that we're going to be grappling with this virus for probably the next year or two until we get an effective vaccine or more effective treatment that's more easily available. So we, um, we also just want to, along with protecting our most vulnerable, we want to protect our healthcare capacity. We don't want to see what happened in Italy or even New York happened to California. So we're really closely monitoring all the time. What is the ICU capacity? What's our hospital bed capacity? What percent of the beds are being taken up by uh, COVID patients? And uh, what percent do we have? So again, and then we, what's not on that chart, but we look at modeling all the time to really look at what are the projections, again, to really try to moderate this and try to slowly allow us to resume some new normalcy. I'm not going to say we're going to be normal for a long time, but some new normalcy while we also moderate and make sure we don't overwhelm our healthcare system or put our healthcare workers in danger. So those are kind of the five, the three different areas and about five different indicators that we have on that data monitoring list. So again, you can get to it on our website. Sometimes you'll just see one number blue and that's flat. It usually takes several days to make sure it's a consistently above the, the indicator level to get on the website. And then sometimes some jurisdictions are on it for um, one indicator and some are on it for two or three. But it's a way we try to get manage to look at what's, what's happening in that community from uh, the epidemiology and also our healthcare capacity. It's a bit of a balance and we are making other decisions about other sectors based on that. Um, the other nice thing about that list is over time, if we learn more about the disease and there's more science or evidence about what those cutoffs should be, we can change that over time. So we wanted to point to something that will be flexible because, again, I've learned so much in the six months, actually seven months now of this pandemic and everything's always changing. So that's just give you a little bit of a framework of what that data monitoring list is. And then um, again, many of you have probably heard this as educators and, uh, and administrators of, of schools, but the, the sort of hypothesis and the science behind why, especially the younger children, we uh, have noticed, you know, very different actually than flu or COVID-19. We've seen that it seems that the younger children seem to have not only less infection, um, but less serious illness. So in California, for example, about 6% of our cases are kids 5 to 17 years of age, and they comprise about 16% of the population in California. And of our hospitalizations, 0.6% are 5 to 17 years of age. So we have a very, very, very low percent of hospital cases um, and a very low proportion of cases even compared to the population. Um, so that's just something we're also, of course, monitoring very closely. Um, and one of the theories behind this is there's something called an ACE2 receptor and that younger children have fewer of them and that the older you get, the more you have. And that seems to be the entryway for COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV virus into the body. So if you have fewer of those receptors, it's harder for that uh, virus to get into your body. Um, and that's some of the theories too behind why kids, especially the youngest kids, might be less able to transmit to others. And then of course, there's other um, evolving sort of evidence about uh, contact tracing in certain settings uh, around the world that had this pandemic start before it did here in the United States. So all of those things really led to us to think about, well, what would be some exceptions, even if we were a little worried about a county? And especially, I think what I anticipate is some jurisdictions are going to be kind of on the border of, you know, they maybe have just been on the list recently. They're doing a lot of other things to really get the virus levels down in their community. But really, who do we want to uh, not only benefit the most from in-person instruction, but who would also be the lowest risk of uh, getting infected in that setting and of infecting others, including other kids or adults. And, and that's why also when you look at our school guidance, what we really emphasize so much is that you all as administrators and staff and all the adult staff that you have, we really want you all to be 
focusing on protecting yourselves from each other because that is the much more likely source of infection in the school setting is adult to adult. Um, you know, of course, you can see the other direction, but the most common will be adult to adult. Um, so that's a good segue to talk about what happens when you have a case in the school setting. So whether it's a student or a staff, um, and even, you know, I'm just going to walk you through what happens uh, at a local level. And some of you have probably experienced either cases of meningitis in your school or uh, measles during some of our measles outbreaks. So this is the bread and butter of what local health departments do. They work closely with the school or say it's an employer. And typically, typically what happens is if a patient gets diagnosed or tested, they actually are diagnosed, of course, by a clinician. And it's the clinician who it is mandated by law that they report to the local health department every case of COVID-19. And again, prior to this, we have that precedent from a lot of other infectious diseases that it was mandated to report so that we could do an investigation. And in some situations, there's something we can do like a post-exposure prophylaxis. In this situation, we would end up doing the contact, the case investigation to find out who might have been exposed. The people who are exposed are the contacts. And then we uh, investigate who those people are and we figure out what the person's infectious period was. So if someone had no symptoms and they get tested, we call their infectious period two days before they had the test up until the time that they went into isolation um, and had no contact with others or typically we say that people are no longer infectious after about 10 days. So two days before the test or the onset or the beginning of symptoms until 10 days after is when we call your infectious period. So then we interview that person or if it's a student and they're not old enough to be interviewed, we talk to the family about who, would, who is this person with and who is that person with who they came within six feet for more than 15 minutes is the definition. It's the most common definition you'll see for a close contact, both by the CDC, the state health department here, and the local health departments are using that same criteria. Um, what's interesting about that criteria as well is that we do think it's likely lower risk if you're wearing a face covering. We will still deem those people a contact, but it is much lower risk. And certainly in the school setting, um, as schools start to open up for in-person learning, we're gonna be very conservative about those initial cases. So again, we will hear about it from a clinician. We will notify, um, often what we'll do then is notify the administration and say, we have a student or a staff person who was exposed. And often if we can do it, if we know enough about when that person was there, and um, for example, it was a staff person who we can interview, we can actually, for the most part, and this is where I think there's a lot of, a close collaboration with your local health department is very important. But uh, sometimes in other employment settings as well, we can work closely with the administration and the person to maintain their, we will maintain their confidentiality to the extent possible to make sure this investigation can happen um, in a thorough way, but also with as much confidentiality as possible. So if the case can be interviewed and I was in X classroom on these days for these hours and the only other people I came into contact with, you know, again, within six feet for more than 15 minutes were at these dates and times, then we can work with the administration to ask who was at those same places and times. And ideally, we don't even name who that person is. I will say, again, having been on the ground at the local level with this often, and all of you know even better, your communities are often very close. That staff person is already disclosing to the employer anyway. Um, and again, it's a very collaborative investigation. But that's essentially how it works. Um, and then uh, there is a chart. I'll just sort of flash it on the webinar here too, but there's a nice little chart in the guidance that we put up that walks through what to do if when you're screening someone has symptoms, what to do if, uh, if you're, say your staff person says, oh, my um, spouse has COVID-19. So you make sure that person stays home, but you don't need to do anything else as far as your school. You just want to make sure that particular staff person stays home for 14 days after their last exposure. And then it walks you through if there's a confirmed case. Um, and then also if you have some of those other scenarios like a person with symptoms or a close contact in the school site, if they get tested and they're negative, that they can come back to school if they've tested negative. Um, if they had symptoms and they tested negative, they can come back to school three days after the symptoms resolve. If they were a contact of a confirmed case, they can still cannot come back for 14 days. And the reason for that is, if you have been exposed, it can take up to 14 days to become infected. So most people show symptoms or become infected within a week, but there are people that can be up to 14 days. So just because you tested negative on day seven, doesn't mean you couldn't still become infectious on day 12. 
So that's why you still have to quarantine for the full 14 day period. But this is a nice way to walk you through it. And more importantly, then you're working closely with the local health department to do that case and contact investigation. So that I just wanted to kind of explain that, especially to people who haven't experienced other infectious diseases in their school settings yet. Um, and to just mention too that um, as many people have heard, we've dedicated thousands of contact tracers across the state from the state health department. And again, local health departments are prioritizing and will be prioritizing school settings for investigations. And that is how it will work with the public health department who again does this all the time for all kinds of diseases will work closely with, with schools to investigate. So I think actually with that, I may pause and uh, answer some questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Reiter. Those of you that don't know me, my name is Stephanie Grankman. I'm Chief Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction here at the California Department of Education. We appreciate Dr. Pan and all of your knowledge um, in helping walk us through the CDPH guidance. Can you tell us just really quickly, we've gotten a lot of questions around where we can find those documents that you were referring to? Uh, sure. So if you go to, uh, let's see, CDPH, I just have it up on my phone to make sure I have the right, um, cdph.c.gov, is that the right? Um, and it's, there's a column on the left that says guidance documents, and the guidance click is on the left. And if you click on that, you'll see a list of a different state health department guidances, and that's where it has one about the reopening guidance. So and maybe we can put a link in the, in the chat or something like that so people can get it right there. Great, we will do that. Thank you, Dr. Pan. Sure. Uh, we've been collecting questions um, over the past few days and, and have gotten a lot already from this time with you. So we have some people who are gonna be asking you a few questions. Um, Edgar Zasueta from the Association of California School Administrators has our first question for you. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Gregson. And thank you to the superintendent, CD, and the governor's office for putting this on on behalf of our members. Uh, even just your opening remarks, Dr. Penn, uh, are, uh, are helpful, just trying to make sense of everything that's come out. Uh, so you talked about some of the considerations for closure uh, at individual schools. Uh, the guidance speaks to some criteria looking at two factors, uh, having confirmed cases in multiple cohorts, uh, but also talks about this, this metric of a 5% positivity rate. Uh, so we, we've been getting a lot of questions from our members of what that encompasses. So in other words, who will be included in that, in, in that calculation uh, in, in terms of how will that work? And then namely from an operational standpoint, uh, school leaders that have to make some of these decisions in terms of what they should be doing, keeping schools open, how, how do, what's the intent of how that will work in terms of that information also being funneled to the school leaders who have to make some of the decisions as they're looking at positivity rates? Sure, um, and I think what might help is to, you know, talk about this in context again of, you know, many of you unfortunately may have experienced norovirus or GI outbreaks, right, or, or even um, in some severe flu seasons, we've seen some bad uh, respiratory viral like flu outbreaks and things like that, and so, you know, a lot of times you'll find um, uh, public health and epidemiologists hard pressed to give a an actual percent. But, but what we look at uh, when we see outbreaks is uh, what we call an attack rate. And so this is basically estimating that you have an attack rate of 5% of the overall population of that entity. So it really would be focused on students and staff who are on campus all the time. Uh, and then how that works is, you know, again, initially, you know, generally this would be something that happens over time, right? So there's a first case or maybe there's a cluster of cases. Um, we would be excluding a whole, if there was a cluster of cases in a, in a cohort or a classroom, that whole classroom would be excluded from school for the, for the duration of their infectiousness or their quarantine. Um, but then if other cases cropped up, right, and you start to say, okay, in a classroom A, you know, there are three cases um, and then in another classroom uh, that's maybe in the same building, you know, there are more that pop up. And so over time, basically, you know, and, and initially when the health department first hears about uh, any school cases or when we hear about potential outbreaks anywhere, one of the first questions we ask is, so how many people are on your site? Whether, you know, so we do this all the time in skilled nursing facilities too. And so, you know, you have X number of students, X number of staff. And so the health department is actually the one really typically that's tracking this and working closely with whoever the school liaison is to track that information. So that's kind of the, the context there. So hopefully that helps. 
Great, thank you, Dr. Pan. Quick question, can you repeat the information about the 14-day quarantine? If you test negative on day seven, you can still become infected within 14 days, correct? Within 14 days from when you were exposed to someone who is infected, correct. So, so the quarantine period is 14 days from the time you were last exposed. So if I went to school on July 1st and somebody there was in a, um, you know, break room with me and we unfortunately, we were, you know, not quite six feet apart. We took off our mask as we were eating and we were too close. Then I would need to quarantine until July 15th, so 14 more days after I had been exposed. And that again is even if I went and decided to get a test on July 8th, because I said, hmm, I, you know, think that's the most common time that I might've been exposed. But that means I wasn't, that I'm, I'm testing negative in that moment, but I still have another week that that virus could be incubating. Again, much less likely, I'd say, well, I shouldn't give you a number that I can't, but most, the vast majority, the median time of incubation is about five to six days after infection, but there are some outliers that, that take longer. So, um, so that is why, and again, we wanna be conservative when we're trying to contain this disease. Great, thank you for that clarification. Sure. Right, our next question comes from the California School Boards Association, Donald LaPlante. Hi, thank you for uh, putting this on, Superintendent Thurman. We appreciate it for the 5,000 school trustees here in California. If a school district goes, a county goes off the monitoring list, and then the county returns to the monitoring list when schools have now reopened, will local educational agencies be required to close back down, or is the closure procedure for an entire LAA only in effect when it has 25% of its school sites infected? Yeah, and we're really glad you asked that because I know we we really tried to think through this and we we realized how hard it is on all of you to be thinking about having to close and open and open and close. So we really wanted to avoid that. Um, and so for that very reason, we have said that, and to your question, that really the, the main criteria once a school is open or a school district is open for a whole district to have to close is if you're really seeing you know, a huge burden of disease in your schools, which would be 25% of your schools have had to close because of you know, essentially outbreaks in their schools. So what the recommendation is, however, if your um, school district is in a place that uh, you open up in you know, mid-August and then in October, the county goes on the monitoring list, we would just recommend that testing happen, uh, either if it isn't already happening of the, the staff right then, to increase the frequency, start testing and try to test you know, one parameter, uh, there's some variation on the recommendations around this. Um, and again, this is because of a combination of practicalities and science, but you could test, you know, a group of your teachers uh, over two months, for example, would be a good way to start. And you could try to divide everyone up every couple of weeks, get a quarter of your, your staff, and then every, another two weeks, the rest, another 25%, and then another 25% over a two month period. And then if the disease seems to be getting worse in your county, we would recommend starting to increase that uh, frequency as lab testing capacity uh, allows. So again, we're really putting a huge other big other effort into that in California and we really will continue to ramp up the testing ability, um, especially as we make more recommendations like this for specific settings. Um, but again, to reiterate, once the school is open, if you've opened for the school year and then your county goes on the monitoring list later, we'll just make sure and you'll again work with your local health department as far as recommendations, but try to be, or to be testing uh, your staff periodically to just pick up cases. And then, you know, worst case scenario, if you uh, are testing and you start to see that you have so many cases in a school that you're having to close the school based on the other criteria, then, um, then you would close the whole district. I'll just add, sorry, I'll, I'll just add to you that, um, oh, sorry, uh, Linda, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that um, this, trying to keep schools open, depends in part, as Dr. Pan's suggestions um, imply, on getting cohorts of kids and staff who stay together um, and are not uh, cross-referencing uh, with lots of other staff and students. So in many countries that have stayed open successfully, uh, the children and teacher stay together for lunch and recess. You know, they stay together during that day. There may be somebody else who comes in during lunchtime or some other staff who help during recess, but you keep the number of people who are uh, in contact with each other very small. 
in high schools, this might even mean having a cohort of teachers, you know, four teachers attached to 100 or 120 students who are their core academic teachers who, you know, stay together in that cohort, maybe with a counselor attached, doesn't mingle with other cohorts. Then if you have some um, infection that occurs, you may need to send that cohort home, but you don't have to close the entire school. So this idea of creating these groups or pods of people who stay together is key to the um, possibility of getting open, staying open, and minimizing infection. Just Great. to build on Linda and Erica's uh, sort of points, I think the, the overall vision too is to kind of set the bookends for uh, outlining where uh, local discretion should be sort of uh, paramount. And so really what we wanted to do is we wanted to set clear state metrics for when to reopen, which is 14 days off the county monitoring list, and clear state metrics for when to close back down, which are, you know, which are specific to the classroom, to the school, to the district, and to the, you know, et cetera. Um, but then in between, it's going to depend on collaboration between school officials and local health officers. Why? Because at the end of the day, you don't want to have to yo-yo back and forth between different instructional models, totally determined by, you know, a formula or a metric. We know that we need to have a formula or a metric to provide clarity for us to all kind of drive towards but we don't want that to be the end all be all. We know that uh, locals need the flexibility and decisions need to have some breathing space to account for um, sort of the nuances and the local realities and practicalities. Great, thank you, Dr. Pond and Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond and Ben for uh, framing that question for, or answering that question for us. Uh, I do have a question for Dr. Pond around um, we have some very large counties in our state. Um, some counties cover quite a bit of large geographical area and the northern part of a county may be um, less affected than a southern section, for instance, like in Santa Barbara County. Um, by having the county lens, it seems that they're now, all of those northern sections of that particular county are inextricably linked. Um, and so is there any possibility that the administration might move towards a more targeted approach um, and looking at more local numbers within those larger counties? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. And I would say, you know, in general, this overall statewide monitoring process um, and the metrics are currently tied to county jurisdictions. And that's the most reliable way we're gathering this data um, and that we will continue to use. That's how most of the local health departments, except for the three cities, are organized. So right now we don't have plans to go more targeted than that. But to Ben's point earlier and to the waiver, I think there are often always, right, there's always unique situations, or not so unique, but uh, local factors that are going to go into decisions that need to be made. So certainly in some of those situations, I think that would likely be a very good case for, um, for a waiver to be um, potentially submitted for elementary school in that situation. Um, and then back to the sort of decisions about closure and outbreaks. Again, you know, the, there's a lot of differences between a very small school in a very urban setting and a very large school in a rural setting and everything in between. So I think there, and, and just even the circumstances of an investigation and what might be happening as far as, uh, you know, and, and even, and actually to tie together also what um, Linda said about cohorts, you could have a large cohort who's been infected and even a lot of cases in that cohort, for example, um, but if they had not been mixing with everyone else, there's no reason to close the whole school down and everyone else should be able to go along and get their education. And if everyone's really good and paying attention to all those rules about not, not mixing with each other and keeping within their sort of bubble or cohort or family, as Linda said, then you'll really be able to minimize the disruption to everybody else once there's that uh, first case. Hey, thank you, Dr. Pond. So since you mentioned waivers, I'm going to have Edgar Sasueta again ask a question that was specific to that. Edgar? Yeah, Dr. Pond, again, uh, we, this question has come up a number of times in, in, in the days since the release of the guidance. So, and then you've actually spoke to this in your introductory remarks. So if you could just clarify that or expand on that a little bit about the process or in the intent. Also, the governor's office can speak to this uh, in terms of working with the stakeholders, uh, working with your local county health office in terms of making sure they hit all the steps to get 
this waiver before their uh, county health officer and getting it approved. I think you spoke, we got a lot of the questions about the intent of why you limited it to elementary schools. I think you spoke to that, but if there's anything else to add, that was part of the question we've been receiving. Mm -hmm. So now do you want to have a little bit over at the process? Is that I kind think of- the process, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. The, the why. Yeah. Sure. And admittedly, we are, um, as far as the state health department to the locals, but, and I think the local health jurisdictions are waiting for us to say, and um, I think by the end of the week, likely we will have a process in place as far as the local health officer could potentially, you know, decide based on local circumstances, um, their local epidemiological data, where they are, um, also other things like the testing resources, like the personal protective resources of a school and other factors um, to request that waiver and then consult with us. Uh, it's a little bit different than that uh, attestation process that you may have heard about to the state health department. It really is that they just need to consult with us. So we're coming up with sort of a form and a checklist so we can track that um, and anticipate uh, reviewing that with our local health departments um, as soon as tomorrow and hopefully get something up soon. And then I think once the local health officers are also clear on um, that part they'll be, and I think they are, I know they already have been receiving and maybe from some of you already some requests on what that will be. So I think the local health departments will also be working out what their process will be to receive those requests. Um, so that will be a little bit localized as well. Uh, and we'll be coordinating with them about that. But that's sort of the, um, the background on that. And just admittedly, we uh, kind of landed on a lot of different parameters about this reopening framework um, uh, just by the end of last week. So now we're working out some of those details. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Pond, how long do you think the approval process will be for school districts once they first apply for a waiver? Uh, I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I think, you know, certainly as far as the consultation with the state health department, uh, we're not anticipating a lengthy process. It's really just a, a checklist of sort of have you considered, you know, X, Y, Z, that again, the epi factors in your jurisdiction, um, what are the testing resources looking like? What's the personal protective equipment situation looking like? You know, do you have enough face coverings for your staff? Those sorts of things. Um, and then I think it may depend a little bit on the, the local health jurisdiction as far as uh, how, many, how many waivers they're receiving and, and what their capacity is. Great, thank you. I'll Sorry, just next? add. Sorry, just next? Add that. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, uh, so I, I'll just add that, you know, in a lot of ways, the waiver process is uh, a formalization of what already should be happening, which is communication and collaboration between local health officers, between school officials, between parents, between staff and uh, labor organizations, and between community stakeholders. Um, I think that part of the intent and vision of the, of the administration is to say, you know, where should we be pointing uh, folks' attention? knowing that there's a lot of decisions to be making, where should we be pointing things and where, how should we be kind of roughly structuring um, the decision-making process? So if you take a look at the sort of what's outlined so far in the, uh, uh, the guidance with regard to the waiver, it's really just touching on a lot of the things that should be happening more writ large, um, but then focusing specifically on one decision, which is whether or not to uh, reopen um, elementary school for in-person instruction. Right. Thank you for expanding, Ben. Um, our next question comes from Gina Plate at the California Charter Schools Association. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregson. Uh, thank you to the governor and uh, superintendent for hosting this session uh, to give us some more guidance. Um, so Dr. Pond, so we've had a lot of questions about testing and uh, you've referenced the testing resources in your remarks, thank you. Can you just expand a bit on active versus passive testing? versus passive testing. Uh, I think it's so screening, active versus passive screening. Mm -hmm. Yes, and in your, in your uh, guidance, you referenced surveillance testing. If you could just elaborate on that, that would be great. Oh, right, right. Sure, sure. So in general, um, when, uh, when we in public health are saying doing testing for surveillance, it's generally people who, one, don't have symptoms, and two, to try to do uh, detection of cases or case findings. So, um, so surveillance of, of staff and trying to do a systematic testing of like the entire school staff over two months would be surveillance testing as opposed to testing someone who has symptoms. If someone comes back with a fever and a cough and they 
can't smell anymore, then that would be sort of testing because they have symptoms, or they or they uh, know that they were exposed to someone outside the school setting, then might, they might think they're exposed and get testing for that reason. That's different than just sort of doing a systematic kind of looking, going to look for cases versus uh, thinking someone might be a case because of symptoms. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for that. Sure. Okay, thank you. And our next question comes from Ted Alejandre, who's president of the California um, County Soups Association. Yes, thank you, Stephanie and Superintendent Thurman for organizing the event. And Dr. Pan, thank you for all your information. You know, our 58 county superintendents in our state are working really closely with their county public health officials and really trying to support all the school districts. And so my question is, uh, how will LEA leaders have info on positivity rates as recommended in the guidance? So there's a couple different things that you may be asking about or positivity rates that are, are going to be at play. But the one as far as the county jurisdiction where the school district is, that, that testing positivity rate is posted on, actually almost all of the county websites have it posted on their website themselves so that they can, people can see their local data. But also if for some reason your local county doesn't have that, our uh, California Department of Public Health website has this county data monitoring list and one of the columns on there is our um, testing percent uh, or or actually on that monitoring list you'll see like a check mark if it's less than eight percent which means everything's good it's less than eight percent there are other places on um, on our state website on our COVID-19 uh, dashboards that you can see percent positivity of every county in the state so that's that if um, I think we talked a little bit earlier too about um, if if one of the one of the criteria for closing uh, a school was if five percent of all the students and staff are positive and again that really is that situation is when you are starting to see cases that have been detected and then you are or say you did start to do even more systematic testing of everybody and if you had over five percent test positive and the local health department would be tracking that as well with you if they're investigating an outbreak at your school. Thank you. Sure. Great, thank you. you. We've had a lot of questions around the waiver of what grade levels it applies to. We have elementary schools that are K-5, K-6, K-8. Um, does this apply to charter, to private? Can you expand on that just a little bit more, either Ben or Dr. Pond? Uh, ben, do you wanna take that one? Or CDE yeah, even, so yeah. I'll, I'll take the first piece or the, the last piece, which is just, you know, who it applies to, whether it also applies to, you know, private schools and charter schools. Uh, there is a, it, it does, quite, that, that's the answer to that. So it applies, the waiver applies and is accessible to all schools, traditional, charter, public, private, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the I, I believe the specific language is that the request should be made by the superintendent of the LEA, uh, recognizing that private schools and charter schools um, as LEAs uh, you know, uh, don't necessarily have superintendents. Uh, the way that it is drafted is that there's a parentheses, I believe this is, or equivalent for private and charter schools. Uh, and so in the case of a private school, for example, that's ordinarily the head of school. Um, really the intent behind the, the um, that language is to say, you know, the, the administrator in charge of the governance of the school community um, should be uh, the one making the request in consultation with all of these key stakeholders. Uh, and then that request should essentially be, you know, filtered through and, and be made with uh, the local health official. That's the sort of uh, process as uh, envisioned. Um, and then I'll let um, Dr. Pan or others kind of touch on uh, the, uh, the other issues that were raised. Or rather, I believe one of the questions was, you know, sort of the um, whether or not um, other grades, I believe all elementary schools uh, grades are, are eligible. And then um, I think that maybe uh, uh, I forgot what the rest of the question was, but I, it might have been regarding sort of the part of the rationale. I'll leave it to others to touch on this as well. No, I believe you answered it, Ben. Thank you. It was around the K-5 and the, you know, our charter, our, is the waiver available to all the different types of schools? So if you are an elementary school and you're K-5 or K-6 or K-8, you can apply for the waiver. Just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. We next have a question from Sarah Baches from the California Association of School Business Officers. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for putting this together it, turning it around as quickly as possible. We represent over 24,000 school business administrators uh, that are 
currently waiting and, and seeking uh, as much support as possible. So we're very grateful for this opportunity. Our question has to do regarding face coverings. Um, if a school, if a student arrives at a school without a face covering and refuses to wear uh, one that's provided by the local educational agency, uh, we are to exclude that student from the from that day or until they're willing to wear a face covering. Uh, so we just want clarification on the face covering requirements and also uh, in, in in tying that with then the services that provide that we provide for our home to school transportation, given that there's different requirements on the age um, grade levels of when they're required to wear masks. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so essentially, uh, as it also states uh, in the end, the student would need to be excluded until they're willing to wear a face covering. So hopefully that will only be a day, but if the student continues to refuse um, for days or weeks, then they would still be excluded. Um, they um, should, of course, still be offered other educational opportunities through distance learning if they are refusing to uh, wear a face covering. And then there are some exemptions for wearing face coverings. Um, if certainly the uh, individual has a, I pulled it up here to have all of them handy. Um, but if an individual has, um, let me just read straight from our face covering guidance, just so I give you all the accurate information. Uh, so, um, certainly there's a medical exemption, like if a, a doctor has said that the person cannot wear a medical condition, mental health condition, or disability that prevents wearing a face covering. This includes persons with a medical condition for whom wearing a face covering could obstruct breathing, or who are unconscious, incapacitated, or otherwise unable to remove a face covering without assistance. People who are hearing impaired or communicating with a person who's hearing impaired, where the ability to see the mouth is essential for communication, that's an exemption. Um, and then some of these others are more related to adults and work. Um, so those are the main exemptions for wearing a face covering. And uh, there, is, uh, there also is some language in our guidance about face shields that can be used for um, kindergarten through second grade as a substitute. Or sorry, two years after then actually through second grade. And then as far as the buses, so our guidance does acknowledge that uh, ideally a full six feet of physical distancing is not or is not always practical on a bus, especially to get more than, you know, four kids on the bus or whatever the numbers are. Um, but that's where face coverings are absolutely essential. So really physical distancing to the extent possible um, and face coverings. So it could mean that one student to a seat, you know, that normally holds two, alternating between window and aisle, which could be three to four feet with face coverings. Um, so I think that is something that, again, you know, I think with all of this, um, and you are the ones really who are in the implementation of it, but, but we are trying to recognize as well that everything is a spectrum, um, you know, further away is better, closer is worse, and, but we want to be able to get kids to um, and, and try to get in-person learning as safely as possible. Um, so that's why a lot of the language you'll see is as practical because we know that there are just different unique settings. I'll just a bit more uh, uh, behind that. Um, this is that you know, first of all, uh, face masks are a proven measure, uh, especially when you know uh, it is more difficult to maintain a hundred percent strict distancing all the time, which I think you know uh, is uh, likely the case in many schools. Um, part of the thinking was, you know, if you're if you forgot. If a student forgets a face mask, they should be furnished one. Um, and OES, uh, among others, is doing their best to make sure that the every there's at least a couple of face mask, uh, both cloth face coverings and disposable face masks for every student uh, being distributed to uh, schools through county offices of education, um, and also to private schools through different uh, for other means. Um, but so that that's the sort of thinking there when it comes to you know uh, an accidental you know, just forgot it at home. Uh, but when it comes to a person who is non-compliant, we made the decision that you have, we have to actually be very ex explicit around um, keeping kids, uh, keeping people who are refusing to wear masks uh, uh, off campus. Um, other states have mandated face masks for schools. Uh, my understanding is Illinois, Washington, and Utah, among others. Um, but we thought it was especially important to be explicit about the exclusionary criteria um, because um, it's a hard thing to 
enforce and uh, at the local level and for folks to comply with. And we wanted to make sure that we were uh, demonstrating that leadership at the state level and making that clear so that you can, um, you can this, so it facilitates uh, local compliance and enforcement. And if I could just add one other point to that, um, the uh, places that have opened schools and it has gone badly, um, Israel, France, South Africa, uh, did not maintain these precautions. So in Israel, they hurried up, they opened all the schools, no physical distancing. They started out with masks, but then it was hot, so they dropped the mask requirement. And within two weeks, they had hundreds of cases. They had to close 300 schools within a month of opening them uh, because they were not clear about the conditions under which they could maintain safe schools. So uh, it's gonna be very important that you know, everyone understand the rules around sort of face coverings, whether those are shields for those who can't wear a mask or masks for kids above third grade and distancing and cohorts so that we don't have that kind of an experience. Great, thank you. We, we have received some questions around um, paper masks versus cloth masks. Um, Dr. Pond, can you speak to, to that issue? You're on mute, Dr. Pond. It was going to happen once during this webinar, so <laughs> we got an hour and in. someone else muted <laughs> um, Sure. So essentially, and I think if someone means paper, I, I'm assuming the question is really more about um, the kinds of sort of medical masks you can see that you can buy that somebody looks similar to the ones that surgeons wear in the, in the operation room. And so uh, cloth face coverings are, you know, reusable and more practical. Yeah, we can all demo our, here's my sort of fancy one. Um, and then it looks like Ben has a different surgical mask there. That's So, you know, I think, uh, so the surgical masks uh, or medical masks are, a little better as far I would like to be too. Uh, a little better as far as protecting the wearer. But the whole idea again about wearing face coverings is to be able to contain the droplets. And then if everybody's containing, then you're really you know protecting each other. Um, and again, there's there's I mean I, I guess I won't go off my um, there's environmental implications too when we're wearing a lot of uh, surgical masks. So I think uh, cloth coverings are really well suited to, especially if everybody's wearing them, it's all helping us uh, sort of protect each other. And, you know, we're trying to get more data out there too, that there's one model out there saying that if 80% of people were wearing uh, face coverings, you know, all the time, we would really bend our curve. And, and, you know, and this is again, I know some people are saying, oh, they're uncomfortable, I can't wear them all day. But I think many of us since mid-March are tired, <laughs> the people who have been staying at home are really tired of staying at home too. And again, we're gonna be, this virus is gonna be with us. We're doing all we can, you know, from public health and a government and, and, and as a community to, to combat this and what we need to all be doing is wearing face coverings and staying physically distant. So I'm just gonna keep hammering that home too because I think we really can make a, a small thing like that can make a really big difference if we all do it. Could I ask a clarifying question on that? Um, it sounds as though you're saying the disposable masks are, you know, less good for the environment. But if a student showed up with one of those, would that be sufficient for them to be um, allowed to oh, right. stay in school? Sure, sure, yes. No, uh, uh, the other kinds of masks, um, any kind of face covering essentially is fine as our guidance and in general to help protect again, uh, containing droplets or secretions. Thanks. Sure, thanks for asking the question. Great, thank you, Dr. Pond. So this next question, we've got, we've got a lot around this question, this topic, and that's around testing. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, Lori Easterling from the California Teachers Association um, has probably a very long and complicated question. So Lori? Oh, I hope not. I hope it's not too complicated. So um, good afternoon, Dr. Pan. Um, the, the idea of testing, right? So like, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, the governor's office as well, and the CDPH recognizing that school employees need to be part of the community surveillance of this virus. So the, the next question is, is we're concerned about the accessibility of, of testing and um, knowing that this is um, happening through employers and part of what's happening at schools, um, how, how is the testing going to occur? 
Is it going to be happening through school sites? It'll be happening through school administration. How do you envision teachers having access um, to tests? Sure, uh, it's a great question. And I think one of the bottom lines is that we also just uh, put through some regulations that healthcare insurance uh, organizations have to pay for testing for essential workers and teachers are named as essential workers. So uh, that is really sort of the mechanism um, that should, you know, minimize barriers as far as, you know, again, the health insurance will reimburse and has to reimburse for this. I think some of the logistics around it are going to vary, again, by, you know, the school setting and the teacher setting. But, but you know, everyone um, presumably has health insurance coverage as a, as a staff person at these schools and should be able to get it at a minimum through their healthcare provider. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be some coordination, but I think the logistics are gonna vary a little bit, um, you know, based on what sort of setting the staff is in. Uh, and the testing task force is also gonna really be focusing on um, making sure we kind of think about schools specifically as a setting that we wanna make sure we get tested. And yeah, and we appreciate that. And, and what and when we're talking about the attest, attestations that counties have to do on testing and contract tracing, does it make sense? I'm asking an open ended question to revisit those county plans, knowing that this workforce is now potentially back online, that those county um, plans have to be coordinated with their school districts and counties to make sure that the testing is in place. Um, because the environment looked very different when those plans were first turned in. So I just throw that out there as a possible recommendation to ensure more coordination because you don't want to open up a school and not have your testing protocols worked out where you know that access is available. And I particularly think of the rural areas in which we're working and I know there's a 60 minute window for rural California, but some of those rural roads in late afternoons after a school Close after school campuses close down are going to be a little bit tricky. So just keep that in mind. And I'm sure there's county superintendents that are probably nodding their head going, yeah, keep that in consideration when looking at that, as well as we know of uh, the elementary uh, waivers that, you know, how those, how the that testing will occur, particularly for those elementary schools that may get a waiver and how those tests protocols will be in place. So that's just, it's a question in my imploring you, you know, and, and Mr. Cheetah, about how we can make this, um, make this very effective. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we'll take that into consideration. Thank you for the comment. Hey, thank you, Dr. Pond. As you were answering that question, some questions came up around uh, face shields with a drape and face shields versus masks. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and I'm just smiling because we've had a lot of discussion over this in the last several days. Uh, so the idea of, so of course, as we all know, as far as um, thinking about development and education, you know, the, one of the huge advantages of face shields is that they're clear. Um, one of the disadvantages from a public health and medical standpoint is that we know this virus Right now, because everything keeps changing, but what we know about this virus now is that it's primarily droplet spread, which is larger, kind of actually almost visible, like when you sneeze and you see droplets, those are droplets. And then there may be some proportion of this virus that can infect other people, which is an aerosol. And essentially what an aerosol means when, when I, as a public health or a, a doctor, I'm talking about that is it's, it's microscopic, it's smaller, it can float in the air for longer, and then people can inhale that as opposed to a droplet that falls to the ground more quickly. So the idea, again, between having like a face covering close to your mouth where you can contain the droplets is to contain as close as possible. If you have a face shield, and it's further away from your face, there's the, you know, the, the concern from a medical standpoint is that you could have um, aerosol kind of float out under and go out. Um, and so the safest thing to do, um, if you're gonna substitute a face shield is to have a drape. And, you know, I think even if it's sort of jerry-rigged, you know, it's actually a very reasonable thing to do or, you know, have some cloth attached and tuck it in. So that's just one that, I, on the other hand, I'd say, you know, especially for the, if it's children that are wearing them, again, we've talked about this, that children are less likely to become infected, less likely to be infectious, especially young children. Um, so, uh, and again, what we've been able to distribute and what we have in our guidance is that we feel that face shields are an acceptable alternative to this. And Linda will be able to tell you about all the other sort of international uh, precedent that is there for that as well. Um, and I think there's just been some practicalities, you know, again, trying to be as practicable. And I think right now we're dealing with, you know, face shields as is without the extra 
are just, um, it's easier to do a wide distribution of that. It's easier to get them to people and um, to be, that's sort of our as practical moment. So and Ben or Linda may want to add more to that, but. I'll just, I'll just <laughs> add the, um, the point, just to reinforce your point, in countries uh, that are allowing face shields, particularly for young children, sometimes it's because uh, it, they need to see it, um, expressions and they need to see their teacher's mouths move and see their, and their teacher needs to see their mouths move as they're learning phonemic awareness and learning how to sound out words and things like that. Um, but where they are using them, they're asking that they come below the chin and wrap around to the ears so that there is as little chance as, as possible of you know aerosol escaping. And as Dr. Pan said, the idea of having a drape at the bottom is also something that um, some have recommended. It's um, not as widely found, but it is, there's a good um, medical reason for it where that's plausible. So we're again, trying to be practical, uh, educational and safe all at the same time. If you were to choose face shields, you really do want to try to find the kind that block uh, the uh, aerosol um, possibilities from spreading. Great. The only thing I would add is that, you know, I think what this conversation demonstrates is that there are so few hard and fast rules when it comes to, you know, our, resp our COVID response. A lot of it is truly a balance between risk versus protection versus practicalities, et cetera, which is the reason why we really depend on the, the collaboration and judgment of local officials to make a lot of these, these determinations because truly, uh, you know, it's not as easy to say just, this is definitely the answer, universal answer across the board. And I think that's what this conversation really demonstrates too. I'll say one other thing about face shields. You know, the thinking about it is that while it is not as foolproof as a mask completely covering, it's better than not having anything. And for people right. who are exempt from masks because they cannot manage them, we do also recommend that if they can be in a face shield, that that would be better than nothing. Um, so there are, you know, those cases too for medical reasons. Um, you know, we're trying to get as close as we can to the safety level that is uh, most plausible. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Pan, we can't thank you enough for your time. We've got a, still just a few more questions for you. Um, okay. And this is around the childcare and preschool. So these new updates on the CDPH guidance and guidelines, do they apply to childcare and preschool? And if so, um, how? So these, this guidance that we have just posted about reopening is, is for K through 12. Um, we, and we did just update sort of our overall safety guidance for childcare programs as well. Um, and we are doing further updates of childcare guidance, but, but these guidelines are, are applying to K through 12. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, so anybody who wants to look at um, the childcare and preschool guidance can find it on CDPH's website, correct? Actually, I'm so sorry to confuse people. Um, the other website, and actually I'll, I'll show up here, is so a lot of the sector specific guidances for work sites and then schools are a different sector is at covid.covid19.ca.gov. And there's cross links, I think, on both sides. Um, While we're I'll on also the just. Subject, uh -huh. Sorry, you go ahead, no, go ahead. Dr. Pond. <laughs> are you sure? Okay. Um, I'll just quickly say, too, that I know um, some of the questions are around. Uh, child care programs and um, and as far as just the open and there may be some variation for preschool programs that are based on school campuses if the school campus is closed and the local school district will decide if the child care or preschool program can open um, but subsidized child care and preschool programs must provide distance learning if they're physically closed so um, and then superintendent Thurman please uh, Dr. Pond or Ben or, or, or Linda, could, as you referenced that there's new guidance for child care and preschools, could you just say a word about uh, high level, what's in that guidance, just for those who are, because those questions are coming up. Does this new guidance that we're talking about today uh, have any impact on what we do in child care and preschool? If it doesn't, what should we know about what's in that new guidance? Uh, I'll start and then uh, Ben, feel free to jump in. But I, the main difference was actually the face covering. So talking about um, that the childcare workforce absolutely needs to wear face coverings and that children under two should not wear face coverings. 
um, but the children age two and older should wear face coverings, especially when indoors or when they cannot maintain a six foot physical distance from others. I think that was actually the biggest change, but Ben, go ahead and add if there's other things that I'm missing. Yeah, I think that's right. I think big picture, what we're trying to do is just maintain a measure of harmony between, you know, treating like categories of, of, of people alike. So if you're a vulnerable population or if you're older, then we want to make sure that we're not kind of creating different sets of rules for different contexts. I think likewise, and for kids, uh, a lot of the updates around childcare guidance and also the day camps guidance was to harmonize uh, schools, childcare, and day camps, et cetera, to the best, uh, to the extent possible, um, to make sure that, you know, to whatever extent there were differences in the guidance, that they were um, driven by the differences in those, in those contexts. And I think that with regard to just whether or not the childcare, uh, how the school's guidance and, and Friday's updated guidance um, affects childcare facility, childcare providers. Uh, it really, I think the main one uh, that it, uh, it, it speaks to in, in some part are school-based childcare providers. And as Dr. Pond said, um, in that case, we recognize that it might be difficult for, you know, childcare providers in those settings to have, you know, to open up without all of the, you know, um, the sanitation and custodial services and other things that we usually kind of just assume are going to be in place for school-based childcare. Uh, and in and, the, and as a result, uh, it's really going to be up to the school officials and the LEA to determine whether or not that's something that um, can be accommodated in terms of the school-based child care. But with regard to other child care provider settings and, 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 and whatnot, uh, yesterday or Friday's announcement um, doesn't um, adjust anything. Great. Thank you so much for that. Our next question comes from Tim Taylor from the Small Schools District Association. Tim, you're on mute. Happen. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. I really, you're a great conductor of Zoom meetings. I really appreciate working with you. And uh, SSDA represents 540 small and rural districts around. And I really want to thank Superintendent Thurman and his staff for the commitment to small and rurals, especially around the work that you're providing the governor's office and the state board around closing the digital divide. Um, it's really time to close it forever and I really appreciate your hard work uh, to get our rurals uh, up to speed with the rest of the state. Dr. Pond, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, distance learning, uh, talking about small distance learning hubs on campus for EL learners, special education, or similar students with significant needs. So if we were uh, taking a, a small group of students um, and physically distance them in classrooms or at, um, uh, I would say like in a multi-purpose room, and they had limited contact with the teacher, possibly an aide and the bus driver in some instances, uh, this would be a smaller staff group that would test and trace if positive COVID did occur. Um, is this tailored program, and that's not a pun by the way, for special education students and others allowed under the new guidance when the school year begins uh, for the counties that are still on the list? Uh, and I think CD is going to speak more to this, but I, I do want to just sort of address like a, a kind of the bigger picture question you're somewhat addressing from a health perspective. Mm -hmm. That completely makes sense and it's certainly a need. And you know, the other, um, as I mentioned, childcare and preschool is going to be open, you know, during the summer, we've allowed for childcare and camps in small cohorts. So for all those reasons, I absolutely think from a public health and health perspective, that sounds safe. And I think CD or others might want to add more to, to that um, answer. So I believe this speaks to what um, our state board president was talking about around those small learning hubs and having one teacher be present and that that is something that each local district can decide to do, um, ensuring that they're working with their local health officer and ensuring that they're working with the staff as well to ensure that everybody is taking the safety precautions that are outlined in the CTPH guidance. So Tim, thank you for your question. Thanks Stephanie, appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we have from the California Federation of Teachers, Rico Tamayo, to ask our next to last question, Dr. Pon. Thank you, Dr. Pon. I, I don't often see leaders in science on a lot of these calls, so I'm happy that you're here with us. Um, 
could you please detail how IEPs are to be written while schools uh, move through distance and hybrid models? So, well, Dr. Pond, do you no, want to go start? ahead? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Rico, for the question. We have a guidance that is on our CD website that speaks to how to um, look, work with the families and engage them, ensuring that they understand how the student services will be provided based on the individualized education plan. And so, and this comes directly from the United States Department of Education's Office of Special Education Programs. And wanting to ensure that, first of all, engaging with the student's family to ensuring that everyone is fully informed of how their child's uh, needs and services, related services will be addressed during any distance learning moments. Um, so within there, you can see a description um, of how the IEP, uh, some language of what can be used to ensure that the IEP covers these emergency situations. As we know, the continuity of learning during this time will be very important, especially in California, as we got, go not only through the pandemic, but we come into wildfire season and potentially public safety power shutdowns. Having that language within all a student's IEPs will be critical to ensuring that their learning can continue and their needs are being addressed. So you can find that on our CDE website under our COVID-19 Pay, uh, resource page under special education. All right. So of, thank you for the question. Um, our final question is going to be asked by um, Donald LaPlante again. Thank you. Um, as we're going forward, it seems like our distance learning plans are going to require a number of our teachers to be in their classrooms to be able to use the school site technology to do distance learning and ensure the quality that we all want and to provide access to the IT and support for teachers. So to be clear, will teachers, support staff and administrators be able to return and go back to work on their campuses physically, even though the students won't be on site while a specific county is still on shutdown? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, you know, I think for most of you, and again, when I was still in Alameda County, even through that March period through the end of the school year, we had a clause in our local order about sort of minimum basic operations and minimum priority operations for school administration to be able to come on site and provide meals, provide the digital technology and distribute those. So absolutely. Um, you know, the most important thing, again, just to continue emphasizing, is that we want those adults, though, to be using their proper physical distancing, wearing their face coverings. I'm sure some of you heard about a recent uh, administrative meeting where um, there was an exposure. So we really, you know, again, uh, the adults are the ones that, you know, are going to potentially be the highest risk to each other. So face coverings, physical distancing, but absolutely. Um, we totally, you know, understand um, and would would want to be able, uh, and allow that you know uh, basic administration and or whatever needs to happen on site at the school to do distance learning there is acceptable. And just to add, this might you know it, it might be helpful for uh, folks who are planning for that setting. Um, as Dr. Pan noted, you, Dr. Pan noted, it's it's really um, the adult the adult is the the risk that we should be ensuring that we're mitigating. Um, one additional area of guidance that you might consider um, is on the COVID dot nineteen uh, COVID nineteen dot ca dot gov website. There's industry by industry guidance, and one of the guidance is is specific to sort of office settings, uh, which seems to me to be potentially the most sort of germane to uh, the um, how how adults should arrange themselves in the absence of kids in a school setting as they're sort of planning and they're interacting in you know face to face. And uh, I think one just thing to add like from a very practical setting like if you're gonna have um, you know, try to do virtual meetings, but I totally get it too. And as we were here in our operations center, it's really helpful to have people. Sometimes you can whiteboard or things, but just, you know, use the extra classroom that the kids aren't in and space people out and have everyone wear face coverings. So that you can, if you're going to have a meeting, um, really make sure everyone's wearing their face coverings and distancing from each other. And, um, you know, that'll be the, you know, if, if you don't have students full of, uh, classrooms full of kids, use that extra space you have to let, allow your teachers to space out um, or your administration to space out so that um, if you need to meet in person, which sometimes is easier, I totally, you know, we totally get that. Again, trying to be practical, but as safe as possible. 
Great, Dr. Penn, thank you so much. That was a lot of the questions that have been coming up, not only in the chat, but we received previously. Um, as our Superintendent Thurman mentioned before, for those of you who asked questions that we weren't quite able to get to, um, we'll be working closely with Dr. Pon and the Governor's Office and our State Board President, Linda Darling-Hammond, um, to get those answers for you and display them on our website um, so everybody can, can see and, and we want to be as helpful as possible. Again, Dr. Pon, thank you so much for your expertise, your time, and your thoughtfulness in answering all of our questions. It is so appreciated. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to our State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, to close us out. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Gregson. Excellent moderation of the questions. We thank you. Uh, we thank you, Dr. Pond, for uh, sharing your insights two weeks in and you're leaning in, and we appreciate that. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, always leaning in um, and literally bringing us pr a perspective from around the world. Thank you, Ben Cheetah, uh, for joining and for helping to guide the conversation uh, around uh, what these different pieces mean and how they connect to all the various kinds of uh, guidance that have come out from different agencies. We know that there'll be more, and we know that there are questions. As Stephanie said, we'll endeavor to answer your questions. Uh, but this gave us today at least a matrix, really, of uh, uh, and, and metrics for when a school shouldn't be open and for when safely a school can be open. We know there's more questions to be answered, and we will answer them together because we can do more together. We've got lots of questions about computing devices. Um, we've got to answer those quickly before school opens. We've got lots of questions about distance learning. We've got to answer those before school opens. But today gives us a great foundation on how we can be safe. And I want to thank the governor and the Office of the Department of Public Health um, for providing that. So for now, continue to stay safe and be well and look forward to continued conversations as we move forward in support of our 6 million students. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.